Section 7 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 1, The Renaissance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Wayne Cook. Chapter 2. The New World by E. J. Payne. Part 2. Here at length we reach a point of view from which the general bearing of the new world on the parallel growth of European economics and politics on the one hand, and of religious theory, philosophical thought, and scientific advancement on the other, might be brought under observation. Our remarks must be confined to the latter group of topics. For during the period covered by this chapter, the political system of Europe was not sensibly disturbed, while the economic changes produced by the discovery and conquest of the new world were as yet imperfectly developed. But the sudden shattering of the old geography produced by the discovery reacted at once in a marked way on European habits of thought. Religion is man's earliest philosophy, and what affects his habits of thought and alters his intellectual points of view cannot but modify his religious conceptions. The discovery of the new world and its prospective employment as a place for the planting of new communities of European origin greatly contributed to substitute for the medieval law of religious intolerance the modern principle of toleration. In the old world the former theory had hitherto enjoyed general acceptance and it rested on a logical basis. There was scriptorial warranty for the doctrine that the Supreme Being was a jealous God, visiting the sins of men not only upon their descendants to the third and fourth generation, but also upon the nation to which such men belonged. And it followed that to believe or conceive of Him or to worship Him, otherwise than in accordance with the revelation graciously made by Him for the guidance of man, was something more than an offense against himself. It was an intolerable wrong to society, for it exposed the pious many to the penalty incurred by an impious minority. Plague and pestilence, famine and destruction and war were brought on a nation by religious apostasy, and it was therefore not merely lawful, but a national duty to stamp out apostasy in its beginnings. The history of Christendom down to the discovery of America is, in the main, one long series of more or less successful applications of this perfectly intelligible principle to the general conduct of human affairs. Had it not been for the new world, the old world might perhaps to this day have been governed in accordance with it. But the new world was virgin soil. All Christendom, with the approbation even of Jew and Ismaelite, would readily have united in the opinion that this gross aboriginal idolatries should be extinguished and the worship of the one God introduced into it in whatever form. And in the plantation or creation of new Christian communities in America, the reason for intolerance as a necessary social principle no longer existed. Each colony, and colonies in this practically vacant continent could be planted at considerable distances from each other, could now settle its religious principles for itself, for it did so at its own risk. In this way the old world found the solution of what in France and elsewhere had, by the middle of the sixteenth century, become a serious social and political difficulty. In France, in Germany, in England, the nation was coming to be divided into two hostile camps, Catholic and Protestant. Was the one half in each case to be extinguished by the other in an internecine war? The banishment of the weaker party by migration, and already expatriation was substituted for the death penalty in the case of greater moral crimes than heresy, was a wise and merciful alternative. The French Protestants, who felt that the course of God's dealings with man must, on the whole, be in their favor, were the first to think of a new career, in a new world perhaps revealed for the purpose as the beginning of a better order of things. 
if not as the fulfillment of the destiny of the reformed faith and as the triumph of the catholic party in france became more and more probable protestant leaders cast anxious eyes toward the american shores as a possible place of refuge for their people should they be worsted in the struggle an attempt of this nature was made with the sanction and help of Coligny, the head of the protestant party by nicolas Durand, better known by his assumed name of villegagnon a knight of the maltese order who had served in the expedition of charles v against algiers and who also distinguished himself as an author and an amateur theologian durand had resided in nantes where the propriety of providing a transatlantic refuge for protestants and the capabilities of the brazilian coast now frequently visited for commercial purposes by french seamen were matters of common discussion he resolved to be the first to carry such a scheme into effect and he found ample support among the partisans of the reformed religion including Coligny, through whose influence he obtained a large pecuniary grant from the french king in may fifteen fifty five he sailed with two ships for the coast of south brazil where he settled on an island still known as alha de falagajo near the mouth of the bay of rio de janeiro two miles from the mainland durant named the country he proposed to occupy antarctic france the voyage was understood to mark and did in fact mark a new era in history it was the actual beginning of the movement which brought to the new world as a place where they might worship god in their own way the puritans of new england the quakers of pennsylvania and the catholics of maryland scholars called it the expedition of the idionauts and a french pedant after the fashion of the time celebrated its departure in an indifferent greek epigram god looked down he said from heaven and saw that the corrupt christians of europe had utterly forgotten both himself and his son he therefore resolved to transfer the christian mysteries to a new world and to destroy the sinful old world to which they had been entrusted in vain preoccupied with the task of establishing themselves in india and the far east the portuguese had for thirty years after the discovery of brazil done almost nothing by way of reducing this district into possession a few ships frequented the coast for the purpose of trading with the natives and setting ashore criminals to take their chance of being adopted or eaten by them the success of madeira as a sugar-growing island suggested the extension of this form of enterprise in brazil to which attention had been drawn by recent discoveries of gold and the soil as in madeira was granted out in hereditary captaincies each grantee receiving exclusive rights over fifty leagues of seaboard martim alfonso de souza afterwards viceroy in india obtained the first of the fiefs and took possession in fifteen thirty one eleven others followed and in fifteen forty nine the direction of the whole colony was vested in a governor-general whose seat was fixed at bahai the portuguese settlements were in north and middle brazil and by choosing an insular site far to the south Drun expected to escape disturbance his first care was to build a fort and mount his guns he announced his arrival to the church of geneva by whom two pastors were duly ordained and sent out with the next batch of emigrants Durand began by sharing with these ministers the conduct of divine worship and specimens of his extemporaneous prayers in the course of which he gave thanks to god for mercifully visiting the mainland with the depopulating pestilence whereby the enemies of the elect were destroyed and the lord's path made straight have come down to us he devoted to theological studies the abundant leisure left him by his administration convinced by the arguments of cyprian and clement he ordered that water should be mingled with the sacramental wine directed salt and oil to be poured into the baptismal font and forbade the second marriage of a pastor fortifying himself in the position he thus assumed by argumentative appeals to holy scriptures when he at last publicly announced his adherence to the doctrine of transubstantiation 
a breach between him and his Calvinist flock was inevitable. Only one among them, a voluble doctor of the Sorbonne, whom he associated with himself in the office of the pulpit, supported his pretensions. When the scandalized colonists absented themselves from public worship, he proceeded to severe disciplinary measures, and, in the end, they quitted the island, threw themselves on the kindness of the savages of the mainland, and made their way to trading vessels in which they sailed for Europe. Thus, the Dionat colony, the first Protestant community in the New World, ended in a ludicrous failure. As the struggle between the Catholics and Protestants of France became more and more desperate, the idea of founding a Protestant colony in America was revived, and it was now resolved to use for this purpose the immense tract which Verrazano's voyage was understood to have acquired for the French crown. Coligny, with the assent of Charles the Ninth, equipped two vessels, which he dispatched on February 18, 1562, under the command of Jean Ribault, to found the first colony attempted in North America since the return of Roberval in 1540. After exploring the coast, Ribault chose Port Royal Sound, in the present state of South Carolina, as the most promising site for a colony. Began the construction of a fort, to which he gave the name Charles Fort, for the protection of those whom he intended to leave behind, and return to Europe. Their supplies being exhausted, the colonizing party fell into dissensions, mutinied against the rigorous discipline enforced by their captain, and assassinated him. No reinforcements arriving from Europe, they built a pinnace, intending to return, put to sea, suffered indescribable hardships, and put back again, more dead than alive, towards the American shore. They were picked up by a homeward-bound English bark, one of whose crew had been with revolt on the outward voyage. Some were landed in France, while those who were not too exhausted to continue the voyage were taken on to England, where the liveliest interest was, by this time, felt in the question of North American colonization. How this revived interest arose may now be briefly explained. The history of English enterprise in connection with the New World goes back in substance to the period of the discovery itself. Even before this, Bristol seamen had sought for the mystical St. Brandon's in the expanses of the Atlantic. Possibly the ancient connection of that port with Iceland had brought the Norse sagas to their ears, and the quest pursued by them was in substance the search for Vineland or New England. John Cabot, having obtained on March 5th 1496, the patent referred to in an earlier page, evidently sailed in quest of the new land, or new island, of the Northmen, and between that date and August 1497, when he returned to Bristol, reached and investigated the shores of Labrador and Newfoundland, which represent the coast called by the Northmen Haluland, or Stony Land. A voyage was attempted by him to the new land in 1498, but not accomplished, and thenceforward English interest in the continent of America relaxed, although the Newfoundland waters were increasingly frequented by fishermen of other nations, so that the voyage of 1496-97 was practically forgotten, when, nearly sixty years afterwards, Englishmen began once more to turn their attention to America. From the untroubled early years of Henry VIII, when America, as yet wholly savage, and its discovery received conspicuous notice in a serious philosophical drama to the marriage of Philip and Mary, when it stood forth in the eyes of Europe as the source of more wealth than the world had ever seen. The New World is scarcely mentioned in English literature, though the continental press teemed with accounts of it and allusions to it. But an old dramatist's picture of the new continent as it presented itself to English eyes about 1515, becomes all the more striking through its isolation. The play, or interlude, is entitled The Four Elements. The leading personage, named Experience, discourses at some length on the great ocean, quote, so great that never man could tell it, since the world began, 
till now these twenty year, end quote, and the new continent lately found beyond it, a continent, quote, so large of room, end quote, as to be, quote, much longer than all Christendom, end quote, for its coasts had been traced above five thousand miles. The inhabitants from the south, where they, quote, go naked alway, end quote, to the north, where they are clad in the skins of beasts, are everywhere savages, living in woods and caves, and knowing nothing of God and the devil, of heaven and hell, but worshipping the sun for his great light. The fisheries, the timber, and the copper of America are named as its chief sources of wealth. And the speaker laments and stands as perfectly rhythmical, though the accent is somewhat forced, that England should have missed the opportunity of discovering and colonizing this vast country. Oh, what a great thing had been then, if that they that be Englishmen might have been the first of all that there should have taken possession, and made first building and habitation a memory perpetual. And also what an honorable thing, both to the realm and to the king, to have had his dominion extending there into so far a ground, which the noble king of late memory, the most wise prince, the seventh Harry, had caused first to be found. Nor is this all that England has lost. Hers would have been the privilege of introducing civilization and preaching the gospel in this dark continent, of leading its brute-like tribes, quote, to know of men the manner, and also to know God their maker, end quote. This task, it is evidently felt, would more fittingly have fallen to the lot of England than of Castile and Portugal. The American coast was doubtless occasionally sighted from English vessels, but it was only gazed on as a curious spectacle. The northern shore, the only part accessible to English adventurers without encroaching on the transatlantic possessions of a friendly power, yielded little or nothing to commerce which could not be obtained with less trouble in Europe itself. During these sixty years, which saw no break in the friendly relations between England and Spain, many English merchants resided in that latter country who must have heard with astonishment, and probably a certain envy, of the rich treasure districts which exploration revealed in quick succession and occasionally visited them, or some of them, in person. Not until the marriage of the English queen with the Spanish heir apparent was it ever suggested that England should aspire to share in the wealth which was the fortune of events that had poured into the lap of Spain. About this time Mexico and Potosi shone forth with tempting luster in the eyes of Europe. These districts were mere patches on a map of a continent which probably contained gold and silver in all its parts, and which had been designed by nature to be the treasure house of the world. Nine-tenths of it remained unexplored. The events of the Franco-Spanish Wars had proved the Spaniards incapable of excluding it from other nations whose seamen were better than their own, and English seamen, then as now, acknowledged no superiors. Other Mexicos and Potosis doubtless awaited the first adventurer bold enough to strike the blow that should secure them. Why should England again neglect her opportunity? It was not, however, exactly in this aspect that the suggestion of America for the English was first put forward. The writer who earned the credit of it, one Richard Eden, Hacklut's precursor, who to book learning added a keen personal interest in sailors and sailors' tales, was a clerk to Philip's English treasury. Possibly he owned this post to a volume published by him in the year preceding that of Philip's marriage, containing a translation of a somewhat meager account of the New World compiled by a German geographer. The object of this volume, in his own words, was to persuade Englishmen to, quote, make attempts in the new world to the glory of God and to the commodity of our country, end quote. And the sole inducement held out was America's wealth in the precious metals. Only a few years had elapsed since the produce of the mines of Potosi were first registered in the books of the Spanish king. Had Englishmen, writes Eden, been awake to their interests, quote, that rich treasury called Peru Laria, the bullion warehouse of Seville, might long since 
have been in the Tower of London." End quote. At this date, Edward the Sixth, a Protestant, with whom Spain's papal title to the New World was not likely to find recognition, was on the throne. His future marriage remained undecided, but it was anticipated that he would intermarry with a French princess, and that England and France, henceforth in strict alliance, would continue the process of despoiling Spain, which France alone had so successfully begun. By the death of Edward and the succession of Mary, the political outlook was changed. On July 19, 1554, Philip of Spain arrived in England, and in the next week was married to Mary at Winchester. He brought with him immense quantities of gold and silver borne on the backs of a hundred horses. Eden's regretful comment was now misplaced. For the contents of, quote, that rich treasury called Perularia, end quote, were actually on their way to the Tower of London. On October 2nd, there arrived at the Tower 50,000 pounds sterling in silver, destined to form the nucleus of Philip's English treasury, in which Eden had obtained a clerkship. He watched the entry of the newly married sovereigns into the metropolis, and his former vision, in a modified shape, now floated before him as a consequence of the match. An ancient commercial alliance was now forfeited by a dynastic one. Spain and England must surely henceforth deal with the new world as partners. Eden now resolved to translate the first portion of the Decades of Peter Martyr, which contained a lively and popular account in a series of Latin letters, written in the fashion of the day, of American history from the discovery to the conquest of Mexico. Other matter of a similar description filled up his volume. And in the preface he eloquently urges English sailors and merchants to quit the well-worn tracks of traditional commerce and adventure boldly to the coasts of Florida and Newfoundland. Although such ideas were doubtless widely entertained, the short reign of Mary afforded no scope for realizing them and the new Anglo-Spanish connection left in the New World but a single and fleeting trace. A South American official, when planning a town in a remote valley of the Argentine Andes, named it Londres, or London, in honor of the union of Philip and Mary. This was the first place in America named after an English city. Its existence was of short duration. The Indians expelled the colonists who were fain to choose another site. The only noteworthy fact during this reign bearing upon the present subject was that a remarkable maritime project was disastrously proved to be impracticable. Its aim was the discovery of a northeastern passage to the Far East, answering to the southeastern passage that was now commonly made by the Portuguese round the Cape of Good Hope. Shortly before Edward's death, Sir Hugh Willoughby sailed for this purpose with three vessels. Winter came suddenly on. Willoughby laid up his ships in a harbor of Russian Lapland, where he and the crews of two of his vessels were frozen to death, while Chancellor, the captain of the third, with difficulty reached the White Sea, landed to Archangel, and returned by Moscow. This disaster stopped further search for the passage. Seamen and traders henceforth turned in the opposite direction and speculated on the discovery of a northwest passage. Elizabeth had been on the throne eighteen years when Frobisher, a Yorkshireman, who had constituted himself the pioneer of this project, obtained the means of bringing it to the test and commenced a fruitless search which lasted two centuries and a half for a passage first proved in our own generation to have a geographical existence, but to be nautically impossible. Frobisher's voyages did little towards effecting their ostensible purpose. Led astray by the quest of the precious metals, he loaded the ships with immense quantities of a deceptive pyrites, which contained a small portion of gold, but far less than enough to pay the cost of extracting it and the scheme, which had degenerated into a mere mining adventure, was quietly abandoned. Meanwhile, the attention of Western Europe was still concentrated on Florida, 
a term denoting all the North American continent as far northward as the Newfoundland fishery, and bestowed on it by its discoverer, Ponce de Leon, who reached it on Easter Day, Pascua, Florida, 1513. Eden's preface conveys the impression that the Spaniards had neglected this vast tract of the continent. Nothing, however, could be less true. The most strenuous efforts had been made to penetrate it, in the confident expectation that it would prove as rich in treasure as Mexico itself. And Pamphilo de Narvaez, chiefly known to fame by his feudal mission to arrest the campaign of Cortes, had landed here in 1528 with the object of emulating that supremely fortunate adventurer's exploits. Repulsed and forced back to the coast, he took refuge in his ships and perished in a storm. Five only of his three hundred men regained Mexico, where they published the exciting news of Florida was simply the richest country in the world. This statement was probably made in irony rather than in seriousness, yet it was not without foundation in fact, for the Appalachian Mountains contained mines of gold and silver which are profitably worked to this day. By the conquest of Peru, adventure to Florida received for the second time a powerful stimulus. Hernán de Soto, a lieutenant of Pizarro, who had been appointed governor of Cuba, undertook to annex it to the Spanish dominions, 1538. His ill-fated expedition, commenced in the next year, forms a well-known episode in American history. During four years, de Soto persevered in a series of zigzag marches through a sparsely peopled country containing no pueblos larger than the average village of hunting tribes, and showing no trace whatever of either gold or silver. In descending the Mississippi, he sickened and died. The miserable remnant of his troops sailed from its mouth to the Panuco River in Mexico, bringing back tidings of a failure most disheartening, because the result of a more protracted effort than that of Narvez. In 1549, some friars of the Dominican order, elsewhere so successful in dealing with the American Aborigines, landed in Florida only to be at once set upon and massacred. By this time the Indians knew the general character and aims of the newcomers who styled themselves Christians and dealt with them accordingly. Outside Spain it was generally thought that Providence had prescribed limits to Spanish conquest and reserved the northern continent for some other European people, obviously either the French or the English. Hence, when in 1558 a Protestant princess succeeded to the English throne, she found the policy which she was expected to pursue in this direction defined for her in public opinion. Here was Florida, the, quote, richest country in the world, end quote, still without any owner or even any pretender to its ownership, though sixty years had passed since Colombo discovered the continent of which it formed a large and prominent part. A whole generation had passed away since the heroic period of Spanish-American history, the conquest of Mexico and Peru, and that period had evidently closed. Clearly providence forbade Spain to cherish the hope of succeeding in any further attempts to subjugate Florida. France, though as ambitious as ever, was hopelessly entangled in civil broils. Everyone expected Elizabeth, who was in truth no bigot, to found colonies in this vast and fertile tract so near to England and so easily reached from it, where perhaps her Catholic and her Protestant subjects might settle in peace, each group respectively occupying some large and well-defined district of its own. The name itself, bandied about for half a century, had by this time become a household word which was without humorous suggestions. Satirist travested it as Stolida, or Land of Simpletons, and Sorida, or Land of Muckworms. Pirates, arrested on suspicion and examined, mockingly avowed themselves bound for Florida. In France, experiences of a certain kind, unedifying transactions of gallantry in the base sense of the word, were called Adventures of Florida. The world was eagerly expecting the impending revelation which should disclose the future fate of the temperate regions of North America. 
To the pretensions of France, the fortune of events soon gave a negative answer. Nothing daunted by the failure of Ribault's party, Coligny in 1565 dispatched René Londinier, a captain who had served under Riblet, to make a second effort. Londinier chose as the site of his settlement the mouth of the river called Ribla by the river of May, St. John's River, from its discovery by him on the first day of that month in 1562. And here he arrived in the midsummer of 1564 with a strong and well-armed party, built a fort, and began exploring the country. Most of the intending settlers had been pirates, whom, in the close proximity of St. Domingo and Jamaica, it was impossible to keep from resuming their old trade. Others joined an Indian chief and followed him to war with the neighboring tribe in the hope of plunder. The stores of Fort Caroline were soon exhausted, and but for the timely relief obtained from John Hawkins, who passed the Florida coast on his homeward way, the immigrants must have starved, or have returned to Europe, or have been dispersed among the wild aborigines. In the next year, 1565, the Spaniards destroyed what was in effect a mere den of pirates, and built the fort of St. Augustine to protect their own settlements and commerce, as well as the still unspoiled treasures of Appalachia, and to prevent the heretics of France from gaining a foothold on American soil. And in a few years, 1572, the massacre of St. Bartholomew put an end to the Huguenot designs on Florida. End of section 7